Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread. I'm coming to you from the Hans Auditorium in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we've held the last four bread symposiums. And as you can see, there's nobody here but me. And this is where we usually have it. The seats are all empty because this year, thanks to you, the symposium will be presented online virtually in our new presentation hall, which is where I will join you in just a minute. Thank you and thanks for being part of our new virtual Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread presented by Puratos. Welcome again. Throughout the entire symposium, I'll be thanking our generous sponsors over and over again, and ask that you do as well by visiting their booths and pavilions in the exhibitor hall. There you will see lots of bonus content and you can also make appointments to meet with the folks from these companies that serve our baking community so well. Our presenting sponsor is Puratos, who has partnered with us from the very beginning for all of our symposiums. And it is their support that helped us get this one of a kind gathering of thought leaders off the ground. Please also visit our fabulous flour and milling sponsors, Ardent Mills, Lindley Mills, and Central Milling. Thank you also to our equipment sponsors, the WP Bakery Group, an allied bakery and food service equipment. And thank you also to our specialty food product companies, ProBioTeam, Fire Within, Big Green Egg, and Mock Mill. Please check out all of their booths to learn about their wonderful and unique products. And also thanks to our media sponsors, Cook's Country, The Local Palette, The James Beard Foundation, and The Bread Baker's Guild of America. You'll be hearing more about all of them throughout the entire series of presentations. So again, thank you to all our sponsors. At the end of today's presentation, you will also see our credit scroll thanking all of the people behind the scenes who made this event possible, including our production and technical partner, Ganoid Communications, our creative team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University, our hosts for this, our fourth annual gathering. So stick around if you will. But now it's time to get things rolling with today's presentation. So let's go live. And once again, welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. And here I am live, for real this time, in the same place where I was on tape just a minute ago. Maybe my lips are in sync this time. Uh, welcome back for those of you who were here last week when we kicked things off because this is our second week of the International Symposium on Bread, second out of 24 weeks. So we're really at the beginning, but thank you all for returning for those who were here last week and for those who are coming for the first time and joining us now uh, on this, you know, today's session. I just wanna uh, mention a couple of things. And one is that uh, you'll see the dashboard to the left of your screen. Uh, you can always go back and, uh, through the archive section, watch any of the presentations that you may have missed. Uh, they'll typically go up about 24 hours after the original day. So uh, if you miss something, you don't really miss it. You can go back and get it at your own time and leisure. Uh, another point is that uh, this Wednesday, we'll begin our Wednesday series of Bake Like a Pro events. We won't be doing them every single Wednesday, but most Wednesdays between now and the end of October. And we're kicking it off this Wednesday with the great baker from New Orleans, Grayson Gill, who's going to be doing his um, unique diaspora baguette. So come back on Wednesday, always at 4 p.m. Eastern, uh, which is of course a different time zone for many of you, but uh, that's when we go live. And uh, if it doesn't work for you to come during the live session, then just join us on the through the archives. And I think that's about all I've got for you today because I wanna you know, give as much time as possible to our fabulous guests, uh, and our, of course, Apollonia Polan is our featured guest of today, who is in conversation with uh, Kim Severson of the New York Times. I'm gonna turn it over to them 
But first, take a look at this. We hope. For over 88 years and three generations, my family has been maintaining an ancestral tradition of baking bread, baker's pastries, and sablés by hand. We use carefully selected grains, creating unique flours that have been stone ground, mixed with sel de Guérande, water, and our own levain. This levain and our environment fosters a natural fermentation that creates a dough which, when in the hands of our master bakers, transforms grains to bread. It's a bread that has nurtured families, communities, and a civilization. It is our daily bread, the staff of life. When well made, it is the simplest but most exquisite luxury. And uh, of course, I've got my poilan loaf, which is, as I pointed out last week, not really a loaf, but a pillow, which I've loved <laughs> for uh, about 20 years now, over 20 years. <laughs> And, I, and it still serves me well. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn things over to Apollonia Polan, Kim Severson. Kim, why don't you get us started? Hi. Um, well, first of all, welcome to everybody at the symposium. It's a real treat for me to be able to do this. I miss all the mix and mingling we get to do at our food conferences. And I think this year we'll, we'll all get back to it. And, um, and welcome to... Uh, really a woman who I, I have long admired and heard about first many years ago uh, from Alice Waters when I was working in San Francisco. And uh, I know she's written um, the forward to your wonderful book, Apollonia, which I hope everybody has studied. And we'll talk about later. Always sell the book. That's what I've learned. <laughs> anyway, how are you? How are you doing? I'm good. And thanks to each and everyone behind your screen watching us this afternoon. It's it's a joy to have you. It's the sun has just gone out in Paris. It's it's um, 10 p.m. and I'm just really excited to be with you this afternoon, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just so everybody knows, we're going to have plenty of time at the end of our chat for questions. So mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a QA and a uh, box where you can uh, add them and we'll make sure that um, we get as many as we can answered because I always find that uh, a wonderful part of these. So I uh, just, I'm sure people have heard the story, just a, a quick top note that uh, your grandfather opened the bakery in 1932 and your father really transformed it into what I think is the most influential bakery in the Western world. Um, and then in 2002, you were 18 and uh, your father and your mother who uh, had been an architect and a designer, um, and many other things I know, but uh, were killed in a helicopter crash, and it and it land, came to you to either sell or uh, take it over. And you were about to enter Harvard. You had a younger sister who was a high school student, uh, and you, I, from all the things I've read, there was no question that you would, of course, take over the business and, of course, carry on the tradition that your family did. Um, so that you. That story is always, I'm sure, told about you when you do these things. How is it to hear it often and often? Does it just feel like your history? Is it, um, is it, does it inform you on the day to day, or uh, how how is it to to have that? Well, hearing hearing, um, so it's it's been eighteen over eighteen years now that I took over my family's business. So you know, whenever I hear the story told by some, my story told by someone else introducing me, it's, it's, it's actually really about counting time and thinking it's one year, it's, um, and then I go to Harvard and I study economics. Uh, I graduated in 2007 and that's five years at the head of the bakery. And then this past year, it was 18 years, 18 years since I took over the family business. And, you know, I looked over my shoulder and I was like, I loved every second of it. Of course, there's harder times, there are challenges and all that jazz, but, but the reality is my grandfather started a business um, and had a very unique approach to baking. My father structured that business, developed it, um, and, and 
when I took over at the age of 18, I had been nurtured by this culture of bread and that has um, fed, fed me literally my culture for bread, but also has inspired me in my journey uh, for the past 18 years and those to come. Yeah, well, if uh, so we have your, your grandfather as, um, uh, as the, the gave birth to this. Yes. Uh, your father um, expanded it, added a, he was an artist, he added the creative sort of piece to your grandfather's vision. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your piece for your generation? My, my piece um, uh, can be summed up, well, it's still based on this, on our roots, which is contemporary by tradition. Uh, this has been our baseline for the past couple of years, and it embodies our understanding and reverence for where we come from and how we can nurture our tradition going, um, going forward. The broader picture is, I view my craft as the crossroads between grains and fermentation. I am on a journey to expand people's views on bread. I want people's minds, or I want to put in very simply, I want to change the recipe for bread. Um, Kim, what's, what's the four ingredients that you put in, in bread or that come to mind when, when you bake bread? Salt, water, flour, yeast. I guess. Exactly, exactly. And flour. I'm glad I passed that, everybody. That would have been bad if I failed that test. But, but here's the trick. Flour is just a technique to grind the grain. Uh -huh. And we have fed our civilizations with so many different grains, depending on where we were in the world, what soil we had, what... Um, environment we were in and we need to honor those grains whether it's wheat whether it's rye i've been working for the past 15 years with corn and i do a 100 percent corn flour bread at the bakery hmm. not like like very like simple ingredients those and 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 i and i work another four um with my with my little biscuit my little uh sable normal and and this is and this is something that's quite unique about Poilan and something that I, growing up, uh, but also working at the bakery, I came to realize meeting, um, as we say in French, my confrère, so my, the, my, um, my peers, uh, and we use 100% of the grains in the different breads we do. So our bread of wheat is 100% wheat flour, the same for corn and the same for rye. Um, so, so that's a little bit of a sneak peek of uh, what's been cooking and what's baking. So you are a grain evangelist in, in the in, of the highest yes. order. Um, yes. Let's talk, since we're on this um, for a minute. Uh, let's talk about the grain. Uh, the the T is it T eighty? Is that the the quality yeah. of the flour that you're using for? Uh, for, for the wheat bread, for the wheat bread, and yeah. um, the the number stands it stands in for how much bran is in it. Is that correct? Of how you grade that so flour? It stands for the ash that would result of the firing of a kilogram of um, ah, okay. wheat flour in that case, um, and you'd be left with eighty grams. Okay. Um, and it's not well. I mean bakers on, on the call will know that it's not a linear scale and there's actually more similarities between a T80 and a T120 than a T80 and a T45. Okay. Um, we try and really capture the taste and the flavor of the grain. And that's actually, you know, how my grandfather started. When he was in the 1930s in Saint-Germain-des-Prés, this was an up and coming neighborhood. There were artists, there were craftsmen, but it was also this bustling Paris where people wanted to eat white bread because it just looked so much cooler. And he was like, this doesn't suit my demographic. I have neighbors who need to feed their day. And this bread brings people together. It's bread that keeps, it's bread that feeds your body. Um, and so he worked with Miller's on, and because he was, you know, setting himself apart, he had other conversations. And, and so we worked on 100% stone ground flowers. And we still to date use 
stone ground flours and where we just take the grain and it's the entirety of the grain that is milled. Um, and, and there's like, there's so many subtleties to, to, to the work we've done, but, but because my grandfather had this vision and because we've nurtured it, almost 90 years later, we're still able to nurture that tradition and expand on it, um, opening up to new, new grains like corn 15 years ago and all the other grains that I work with my cookies. Let's drill down on the corn for a minute. Um, I know there's a, um, a, a very big push to, to expand the varieties and to bring back many varieties of land race corn in Mexico. Um, what kind of corn are you using for, uh, or, and where, how are you sourcing it? Yeah, so the way that I've been, so first of all, I should, um, uh, um, so I, behind me there's, I don't know, I'm trying to be correct. There's, um, there's my wheat uh, sourdough bread here, mm -hmm. and you have my rye bread um, here, and then you have my cornbread here, and that one I've done in a tin because shapes, um, because uh, to, to help the, the keeping it together um, since it doesn't have any gluten. So when I started working with corn, my inspiration actually came from my Harvard uh, college years where I would eat cornbread. And in my, in my mind, cornbread was, in French, I translated it as pain de maïs. And so when I looked at cornbread recipes, I realized that there was always 50% wheat, 50% corn, if not more wheat than corn. And that was senseless for me because I came from a tradition where you said, I make a wheat bread, I make a rye bread. It's 100%, or at least a poilane of that grain. So I started working on my, uh, on my co cornbread recipe. And so I went to my millers and I said, Do you, are you working corn? I met growers. Um, France is a country that doesn't highly regard corn. We see it as a very um, thirsty crop. It's also associated with GMOs. Um, so it's, it just has a really negative reputation, even though all of the growers that I know have all told me, corn, not so sexy, but it's very filling. And you're like, okay, so what do you use it for? Oh, we use it for animal feed. And, 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 you know, and it really is, there has been over the past few years in France, a revival of heritage. I don't know how, how heritage they are, but like, let's say, uh, since anyway, it's not a native crop for, 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 for France, but there has been some like um, older varieties that have, that were, that, uh, that were not imported in the recent years, but that have been grown for decades and centuries since corn was important from the Americas. And they have given rise to a beautiful um, um, conversation where actually it's mostly um, um, pig farmers that actually care about the corn they grow for their pigs that have helped us bakers <laughs> develop a quality huh. like grain. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, it is. It is. So, so um, the corn, when you're looking for corn, and again, I, I don't go too deep in all because we have many things to talk about, but I'm so curious, what do you look for in a good corn? And is it, is it like a dent corn or are you looking for, um, is it, is it a taste or uh, a performance issue? How do you know when you found the right corn? I imagine you looked at every single corn you could possibly look at and considered it <laughs> so, beyond. So first, yeah. So actually, so first, Kim, I should I should share with the audience that I'm half French, half American. So corn came quite naturally to me, and I had the vision that corn came in all um, shades of colors. Whereas if you ask the average French person about corn, they think of that pale yellow um, right. corn cob, and usually actually canned corn. Um, so for me, there was a lot of looking at the different varieties you could find in France. And then it was a confluence. It was like, it was paralleling what I have in the work I do with my millers on wheat and growers on rye and, and mirror that and bring what I've learned with those um, grains, um, whether it's varieties, um, whether it's how, um, how sweet they are. Um, um, and, and the thing is, 
their performance is one thing, but I've been, it's, it's like, it, it's trying to really um, find, so for instance, like finding different varieties and trying different varieties. And then there's a the question of the availability of those right, right. qualities of grains. Cause once again, it's not used mainly for, um, uh, for breads. Right. And you you're not keeping any they it doesn't have gluten, right? And so you that's the 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 loaf that you did. It's just what what yes. is in your corn? Maybe you can tell us what's in your corn loaf. One hundred percent. So so and 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 I explain it in my in the book that you held, my my book, Fualan, um, uh, published at Houghton Mifflin last uh, fall of 2020. Um, in um, so I'm I try to mirror the simplicity of the ingredients of my wheats and rye breads. So water, salt, sourdough, and that grains flour. So um, flour had to be corn. The sourdough had to be a corn sourdough. Salt, well, was salt. And then the last ingredient was water. And little did I know that from my tests and trials, from the time I spent in the kitchen, from the Saturdays and weekends I spent test trying different things until I realized it was dark outside, um, I knew that um, oat milk provided a bind and combined uh, with flax seeds created just the truckster needed for corn to bring them together. And this was important to me because as we were, as I was working on this recipe, I was adamant that we would do a 100% corn flour bread. However, I refused categorically to use either any like synthetic binders, because in my mind, it's just about substituting one ingredient for another, and let alone the fact that you didn't necessarily know what are the long-term effects of them. I also didn't want to use the classic trick of putting eggs or sugar as a binder, because in my mind, and this is the very French side of my mind, this is a bread, not a brioche, not a cake. So there's been many iterations that I've done and tests and trials, and actually in the book, I put one of my tests that was pretty good, but it's a brioche mm -hmm. um, using corn flour. But my, that was sort of my, that was my goal. That was my, that was my Northern star. It would be 100% corn flour. And it had to have the simplicity of the ingredients of my wheat and rye breads to live up to their reputation. Corn sourdough. Mm -hmm. Stunning. I, just to, to go back to the wheat for a minute, how many of the millers um, or, or the growers that you, perhaps families that you, your grandfather worked with, were you able to keep? And is that the, I would imagine that's the most difficult thing is the variance of nature and families who are growing your grain, right? No, that's true. That's true. And what's beautiful is that um, we still work with the ones my grandfather originally um, worked with. Um, and although that the specific mill was bought out by one of our other suppliers per our intermission, um, and yeah, so it's, it's just, you know, I think the story, the bigger story that we're telling here is that when we are baking bread, when we're sharing bread, it really is about bringing community from, from the earth, from the soil to your table, your plates, and the community is, um, the growers, the millers, the bakers, and the consumers, and feeding that virtuous circle. And it's no surprise that, you know, our civilizations came to become organized around growing grain together, protecting grain in um, cities, um, having, um, you know, there's expressions in French um, about, um, um, grain that showed its value and, 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 and more broadly speaking, if you look at history, I mean, there hasn't been a single revolution that wasn't started at some point or another for anything else than the lack of food and bread is usually that symbol. Yeah. And that's the French revolution. It's the, it's the Russian revolution, but even the Arab Springs. I mean, like I remember opening the mold and having like this dystopic view where I was like, why are these men holding these like flatbreads in their hands? And I was like, that's weird. And then I was like, no, that's their bread. That's what they need mm -hmm. to be fed. And, and that's, I think the essence of our craft, we feed communities. Right. Well, let's, let's take that for a minute uh, and, and talk about the pandemic, which 
was quite disruptive to communities and yours, I know, yes. especially. Um, I mean, there was no sort of greater test, I think, for what community meant than than getting through this pandemic. Um, I know you you found obviously your restaurants were closed. There were the retailers were not doing as much business. Yeah. And I, I imagine you felt very separated from the people who were eating your bread. Um, tell us how you how you maintained and did you have to I mean, you closed uh, a lot of the, the bake shops and things, I suppose, but tell us how you managed and where are you now with, with things? Yeah. So let me give you a little bit of context on how the pandemic unrolled in Paris and the UK where I've been operating for 20 years. Um, and then I'll come to your question, uh, but I think it needs a little bit of context. Um, so we're, we're mid-March. France closes down their restaurants overnight. And then we get the announcement that we're gonna undergo a lockdown. We can't go out of our houses without justifying either on a piece of paper or uh, by an app that why we're going out and we have a very specific perimeter around which we can go. Um, so it's very, you know, like literally this, the streets of Paris are so empty that I could cross the, the usually filled crossroads uh, right by the bakery without even looking at where I was going. I mean, I saw ducks on the streets. Uh, I saw um, um, foxes on my way to the manufacture. I mean, like, <laughs> like a, a proper lockdown. <laughs> and, and so I say this because naturally our restaurants were closed, our retailers were you know, trying to organize themselves. Um, and in London, went under a somewhat of a similar route, although at a slower pace, two, three weeks later. Now, with this context, what happened was we had, I was, I had one goal was from day one, it was making sure that we were open and that we um, fed whatever we could for our um, customers, whether they were living. I mean, like we had people coming in, um, from a little further than um, their district, uh, from our from the bakery, um, and and you know stocking up so that they could like freeze the bread because they didn't know when they were going to be able to come back. Wow! Um, so I started selling eggs because I was selling less pastry, but also because I had eggs and that I knew that the chickens excuse my French, but didn't give a damn about the pandemic. And that was available. And since it wasn't on the supermarket shelves, I might as well sell them. Mm -hmm. um, I started selling coffee, vegetable baskets. And I'm saying this to say that it really has nurtured and fed and my understanding, but also my conviction that bread feeds a community. And that is our bread, but it's also all the ancillary things that we produce with it. Like you should have seen, like we normally sell these beautiful bars of chocolates by a chocolatier in France. I mean, our clients were devastated when we ran out of the stock and because pastry chefs weren't sure and chocolatiers weren't sure that they could carry on their job, like we had a shortage at some point. But um, it was also, and I wanna, I also, I'm, I'm like, I, I feel like I'm painting a really grim story here, but there, the light and the beauty of this was how much solidarity it brought out in people, whether it was the lady that on the first day of the pandemic refrained from buying the three loaves of bread she wanted and said, look, actually I can come back tomorrow. So just give me one. Um, it was, I engaged um, uh, um, with my partner in accepting any opportunities that we, uh, that were, that we were given to um, share insights into baking bread because as we all know this was one of the biggest google searches um last spring the one of like people discovered that at the bakery we've been selling flour for quite a long time but um they discovered it on that occasion um, um people started having sourdoughs and naming them in a way that we had never seen in france and i think you know in these times of uncertainty in times of like fear like just the beauty and the meditation of putting your hands in water, whatever grain, flour, salt, and, and a sourdough, or even yeast, and just getting that dough together, giving it a breath and its final shape, baking it, and then opening it up, smelling it, and 
eating and sharing with your copains, the people with whom you literally share bread. I think that is something that our craft has and that no one can steal us. And something, an object of pride, something that we need to nurture. And so if I look at the pandemic a year later, I feel like it has had some, it has been a very colorful year. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it's, I've, I, 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 I mean, like, for all of the, 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 the funny misses and the, and the, 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 the weirdness of it, I'm sorry, I'm losing my words here, because mainly I'm like trying to um, try and capture the sense that, yes, it was, it was a very particular year. And yet, it further convinced me that bread is the staff of life. It is the thing that feeds you. It is the thing that brings people together. And whether you're alone with your hands in the dough, enjoying that meditative state, whether it's nurturing your sourdough to bake a loaf of bread for your family, or as a professional baker to your community, this is where our craft has, it's a value that is just unparalleled, I find. Yeah, and, and you know, um... I love the, I love that uh, we all realized how important bread really is to all of us, you know, from all the things you said. And one thing I really love about um, the things that you've expanded my mind about is all the ways in which I can use bread and, and, and respect that loaf, um, yes. ice cream uh, as the grain instead of bulgur and tabbouleh, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and your granola recipe, which I find fabulous. Um, so all of those things, you know, I think, makes us all think differently about bread at, at a time when um, uh, uh, making the most of what we have and what's precious matters more than 100%. Ever. Yeah. And you know, Kim, when you're saying this, it's remindful that I think the people that baked bread and who had either never baked bread or just started it as a hobby or whatever their reason, I think that we've gained people who have an appreciation for our craft and when you have that loaf of bread, when you know the love and attention that's gone into it, and it's true, we had talked about this thing about not wasting bread, not because we can't, but because I think we need to honor mm -hmm. the work that's been going on. It's the six hours that it takes to bake that loaf of bread. It's the nine months we train our bakers at Poilan from scratch to teach them how to own the gestures and attune their senses, develop their intuition. It's the year that the miller has taken to grind the grain. It's the year it's taken to grow in the field and really three years usually before that. And I think that when you have that value chain, there is no one that would be like daring enough unless it was really molten to throw away a loaf of bread. And that's where bread cooking comes in because our forefathers knew how to use bread in any number of different ways, whether it's French toast, pain perdu, lost bread, or um, other more creative ways. And I think that for me in my book, what I tried to instill is an idea of expand your horizons on what are the uses of bread, mm -hmm. not only as a food, but also as an ingredient. Mm -hmm. Because from right. crust to crumb, there is no reason in the world to throw any single slice. I think that was um, absolutely the rev the revelation in your book for for many people. So uh, let's uh, we have uh, I see people are starting to write questions and I yeah, hope you sorry, guys sorry. send some more. <laughs> no no no. Um, there's just some other things I wanted to ask you about. Now I um, uh, I just want so are you back to business and and I know at it, it, at some point I think uh, that very famous New Yorker profile that was written about you. Did you like that by the way? <laughs> I did. I did. Um, okay. I did. You know, it yeah. came just around the time that I was opening my cafe in London. And I look at it 10 years later, and I'm thinking, wow, so much has gone by. Yeah, yeah, um, right. That's a great piece. People should read it if they haven't. It's um, from 2012 in the New Yorker, and it's and it's And anything by Lauren Collins, actually. Yeah, I just all... <laughs> like you, all like you, they, you are yeah. two very incredible writers. Oh, 
and you're not even close in that realm, but thank you. Um, but anyway, in that profile, you said that, I think uh, she said that um, Holan was grossing $18 million a year and employed 160 people. So say that was 10 years ago. Um, and I know the pandemic is tricky because you've, it's a different thing, but where are you now? What do you think, like right before the pandemic, how much was Polan uh, grossing a year? Yeah, so we're talking that those were in dollars of 10 years ago. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're closer to 10 currently and, and we have 150 um, teams in our... I see. Um, I, I like to describe our, in French, I would say compagnon and collaborateur um, or describe my crews as pairs of hands because the hands of the bakers, the pastry chef, but ultimately all the people who create and nurture um, the value chain at the bakery um, are pairs of hands and people's intelligences at hand to create, sell, deliver the loaf of bread. Um, so um, it's something that I want to insist on because I think that um, our hands are such a sophisticated tool. First of all, not taking it for granted, but also trusting um, them and the intuition they carry. Um, and uh, well, I would say attuning, you know, just yeah. listening and, and attuning our five, our five senses, opening them up to that. Is this, this must be what you learned very much from your father. There's a, there's a, a bit, um, in your book where you talk about being in an empty grain silo as a child with your yes. dad and he yep. told you yep. to, to brush your hands against the walls so that you could bring up the smell of the barley and that that would yep. imprint what barley smelled like to you so i have to assume that every beautiful thing you just said must have come from the spirit of your father 100 percent, and that of my grandfather before that and and ultimately my my family both my father's um, family and my mother's family. Um, they were incredible people who knew the value of things that are handmade. My mom as an architect designer, my maternal grandfather as a cabinet worker, my father's side of the family as um, uh, uh, agriculteur peasants um, um, in, in France and so growers and and I think that that yes you're right that is exactly where it comes from it's about those lessons that are not written in books but that you learn through um, the sharing of knowledge and the instilling of of intuitions in, right. in, into into in, into the next generation. But but let's not forget that you have an uh, uh, economy, a degree in economics, and also that you're running a multi-million dollar business. Um, so, you know, there is a balance there you have to do, right? And and one hundred percent. You know, you you sell. Um, you have a, a large retail operation. You have um, expanded into certain kind of mail order business and, and other things. Um, you know, you've got to keep the business running. So how do you consider uh, a product when you want to expand it? And, and uh, do you worry about hurting your vision as you grow more products? Are you worried about, mm -hmm. about branding? And if you, get, if you get too big, and this is a story as old as, as marketing and commerce, if you get too big, will you dilute the brand and the beauty of the handmade nature of your, of your business? The short answer is retro innovation. The longer answer is how to honor the best of past techniques, but a systemic understanding of our craft and what modern technologies and tests and trials have to bring to the future. Um, I think the manufacture, so I, I should say that we have, we have both a B2C operation where we have four stores in Paris, soon a fifth, and one in, in London. And then we have, um, um, our B2B, which is both restaurants and retailers, retailers ranging from the small specialty store to a larger supermarket. We serve our clients at close as we can to their doorstep, if, and that's if we don't mail order to them. Right. And how many loaves a week are we talking about when you're full we, speed pre -planned? We bake anywhere between three and 5,000 loaves every day. Every day. 
Okay. So you and the way we do it, and and you know, and this is the beauty of it. The way we do it is is what my father really created with my mother at the manufacture. He had the understanding of baking, and my mom had the understanding of design and architecture, and together they crafted a place that responded to the classic dilemma which you pointed out, which is how do you grow without um, basically breaking quality or, or how do you grow without compromising on quality rather? And their response was, first of all, we have a craft that allows us not to compromise on quality. Like when you make a, lo a batch of 50 loaves of bread, it actually turns out better in the oven than two loaves, the same way you wouldn't do a choucroute for two people. Right, right, right. That's a very French alization example. So yeah, yeah. you figure out one. another one. I wouldn't do a barbecue for one person. That's, that's, right. there you go. that's a quick, quick parallel. Um, but, but, um, but so the point is, they created the manufacture and what they thought was, you know, the classic route to, to growth is you create um, um, just one uh, chain where there's the, 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 there's the doughs, there's, then there's, and, and just creates uh, a chain work. And what they conceived of was a building that has a shape of a circle at the center of which we have our wood stock because all of our bread, cookies and pastries are all baked in a wood fired oven. We've been used to it. We believe that it's amazing because it's got a very dry um, heat and it makes for like thoroughly cooked bread. And that is something that's important for digestibility. And then around that center like wood stock, there are 24 ovens, one next to the other. And it's a little bit like, um, Right, so, so we have 24 little bakeries, one next to the other, and each baker works on their dough from start to finish in the same way that they do in our stores. Mm -hmm. So you have the same quality bread in Paris, London, or at the manufacture, just in the outskirts of Paris. And it is that same process where one baker is in charge of their batch from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's the- few hours they can start uh, a new batch. And, my, and, and, and the best part of it is the words. My parents chose manufacture to embody the name of that place. It's not a plant, it's not a factory. It's a manufacture, a place where our hands are put forward and where, or manu means hands and facture is for the factory, but it's also the creation, the crafting. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's the place. So, so the, the longer to, to cut the long story short, we get back to this same thing. How do you grow? The answer was retro innovation. And that has been my father's, um, were my father's words. And I think they beautifully embody his philosophy, um, and, and his reverence of past techniques and constantly questioning and trying to go forward and nurturing that tradition because he has that past. He knows his roots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, are you, can you take a couple questions? I know we're kind of getting close on time. So I, a couple people. So here's one, if you're ready. Uh, so your book calls for active dry yeast in almost all the recipes. Why and how do you use it? Is it possible to substitute others like instant yeast? And why do you add yeast to your sourdough breads? And then they say, thank you for helping them understand this. Um, well, thank you for your question, first of all. Um, in my book, I have three parts and I try to really capture the environment and the rhythm of the bakery from morning to daytime to nighttime, which I think is always conducive to you know, it was my time spent in the in the bakehouse at the wee hours that has really fed my understanding of grain and given rise to the different um, well, my outlook on bread, uh, my understanding of grains and all of the new products that I've worked on. You know, the collection of cookies with the different grains, for example. In my book, I provide a recipe for how to bake at home a bread that has the spirit and carries the the the, um, the spirit of the way I bake bread at the bakery here. But I also realized that you don't have a hundred ton brick oven 
And so, and I also, there's sourdough, especially the way we use it, where we have a piece of dough from one batch that serves as a starter for the following batch. And then we bake the following batch, keeping a piece aside. And that piece aside then becomes the sourdough of the following batch. And that's been going on for 80 years. And that I realized needs to start somewhere and it takes time. Mm -hmm. And in my book, I offered any number of Kickstarters and ways of just jumpstarting a little bit, trusting that the more experienced bakers, the more daring bakers would jump ahead. But the most important thing for me was to get people's hands in the dough and get started. Mm -hmm. um, so wean off the, 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 the yeast as you go, as you feel your starter, as you jazz with it. And, um, and, and then, yeah, um, and then experiment with different grains, test and try. The worst that can happen is that you have to start back from scratch. Yeah, great. Um, so we're uh, tight on And I'll be shorter. Want, well, I just want to throw a few things. Yeah, I want to make sure. Okay, first of all, uh, someone just says thank you. So just so you know, um, when are you going to be opening a bakery and cafe in the United States? <laughs> because we're America and we want to know about us. When will you <laughs> open with us? I, I, the short answer is I don't know in these funny times, but um, I'd love to open. Is it a possibility? Um, I mean, have you thought of look, it? Look, anything is a possibility. Um, okay. And I, I, I'd love to, um, I, I um, you know, you can order my breads on my website, Um And I have several um, retailers, uh, Fermaggio Kitchen, that when I ran out of bread when I was at Harvard, uh, I would go to his uh, delicatessen in um, Cambridge to get bread. Um, we also have uh, um, retailers in, 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 um, in different places, but across the US, I'm thinking of Zinka in LA. That's a fantastic cafe that uses my bread. But the point is, um, to answer more just strictly your question, I don't have strict plans, but I'd love to, <laughs> to happen at some you, point. And just, do you think you could recreate your bread and actually bake it over here or it would be a completely different thing? Um, it's a different beast, but look, we managed to do it in London mm -hmm. and I think that's a good testing ground. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, and but, this one, this... but, but the trick is time yeah. and okay. appreciating time and the value of it. Right. Um, I mean, we, we, I think everybody wants to go and, and have some one-on-one -on -one time with you in the, um, uh, digital cafe, uh, the digital like green room afterwards. So we need to wrap this up, but, um, and this is actually a great, Last question. How do you see the future of bread? Will Poulain still be baking the same kind of breads in 20 years as you do today? Or do you see things changing? I think it's a great question. Um, you know, we, last year we celebrated our 88th anniversary and it was symbolic to me because it was 2020 and 8-8 eight, eight, and we, are, we were started on number eight with the D and eight represents infinity if you put it things and I, I just thought it was a very beautiful symbol and you know if you look at our sourdough wheat bread recipe it's it's been perfected over the years I mean it's had 88 years of, ex of existence to perfect itself our why has been around for a long enough while that has also been perfected. Our cornbread is 15 years old and I reckon that it will be better in the years to come because we will test and trial and get to a point where we're like, we've plateaued and we're cool with that. And there will be more grains, more breads, the same way we've developed the, our, um, our uh, sablé, res, um, uh, grain sablé uh, range, our baker's pastries using different um, grain flour varieties. So yeah, so I see, I see that and growing, but I really feel, I really feel what's important for me is, is to, is, is to grow and not just blow up in some ways. And I, and this is, I think has to do a lot with the way we go about baking, which is using sourdough where it, it has that sense of time as an ingredient that needs to be honored and appreciated. And honestly, one of the hardest things when you're an apprentice, like I was when I was 16, and you look Patience. at the baker and you're like, 
I'm never going to manage to do it. And then a few months later, you're like, oh, I just managed to shape my first loaf. Wow. And then you move on in your apprenticeship and nine months go by and you realize I can do the same thing as my baker, um, my master, my master of apprenticeship. Um, and, and that's, and it's kind of the, it's the journey that I initiate and, and encourage people to undergo. It's the one that I've um, featured in the master class class that um, on the platform um, that that came out in December. And, and it's also that spirit that I try and encapsulate a little bit in my book. And it sounds like, Kim, you've, you've definitely got it. And I'm just, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, listen, thank you for this. And I know Peter has popped up here. I'm uh, jumping back his... in. I've got my, my you know, it uh, looks, emotional it looks support pillow like here. <laughs> yeah, you, you were just, I hope you weren't taking a nap on the pillow while we talked, Peter. No, I was talking <laughs> it the whole time though. Uh, and uh, and again, and I want to thank uh, uh, Kim and Apollonia for this this hour, which has been going by real fast. And I'm sure that I'd love to keep it going. For some of you, we will keep it going because those of you who have the VIP tickets will be able to join us. We're going to take about a five minute break, and then you can uh, you can actually move over to the if you if you have that ticket, just move over to the VIP lounge in the lobby and uh, and click over on that, and it will let you in at uh, oh, in about five or six minutes. And we'll continue the conversation in a more informal manner, more Zoom uh, meeting style with everybody having their, their, their cameras on and up on the screen. So we can just talk casually. A lot of good questions continue to come in. And if you're joining us there, you'll be able to maybe continue asking those. Uh, for those who didn't uh, get that ticket, uh, I'll let you know that there is the option of upgrading. Just if, if you like, we had three people just even during this session, uh, write to our team and ask if they can upgrade to the VIP ticket. It's just a few extra bucks. I think it's worth it. Um, and that like, gets you into what we call the after party, which is where we're going in just a minute. Um, all you need to do is, is use the button on the, uh, on the, either the homepage or on the uh, lobby page that says uh, support or question. And so it's question at breadsymposium.com is the email. But if you hit support, it takes you to the same place. And just let them know, let our tech team know that you'd like to upgrade and they'll get back to you and, and get you in. Um, but for those who are not joining us, I want to thank you for giving us the time that you did. We're not going to be recording the after parties because, you know, who knows what's going to happen there. So we don't, we're not going to put those out. So those are only for the people who have those tickets. So we'd love to have you join us. And, uh, and, and again, both Kim and Apollonia will rejoin us in five minutes in the VIP lounge. And uh, we'll just call that the after party and stay, they'll be able to stay for as long as they can. But of course, remember that in France right now, it's about what five, six hours, seven hours uh, ahead of where we are. So it's way past your bedtime, Apollonia. We will thank you so for staying <laughs> you. up. I don't know what you, what it's gonna be like tomorrow when you go to work. I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's you, Kim, and the fantastic team behind the Brent Symposium and also my partner in life that are all keeping me up <laughs> right now. All right. Thank you. I'm sure, we'll I'm sure see there's you. some coffee somewhere in the uh, in the background there as well. <laughs> there was some coffee this afternoon as well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie on that one. <laughs> okay. Well, then what we'll do is we'll just say, we'll, we'll say goodbye to all of you uh, from this screen, from our webinar. And those of you who can rejoin us in the lounge, please do so. And for those who can't, maybe we'll see some of you on Wednesday. Uh, come for Grace and Gill's demo. Uh, come back next Monday. Carl DeSmet will be... Uh, with us next Monday to talk all about the uh, sourdough library in Belgium. So it's just every week, something new. Uh, if you're not sure what's coming up, just go to the, to this, to the calendar, the scrolling schedule on the homepage. Uh, Apollonia, Kim, thank you again for, for this great hour. And we'll see you in just five minutes. Thank you. Right, and thank you to each of you for listening all throughout. <laughs> thank you. Bye. you to our team behind the scenes. Our event technical and production partners, Ganoid Communications, including our producer, Gurmit Singh, and his team, Jida Gajaria, Gagandeep Singh, and Jaydev Kashari. Thanks also to Ted Nelson and Lael Fretzel of our creative and marketing team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University who supported me throughout this event. 
my executive assistant, Sarah Standifer, communications director, Melinda Law, Chancellor, Mim Rooney, Charlotte campus president, Cheryl Richards, and our executive team leaders, deans and faculty, Maureen Dumas, Michael Schrader, Michelle Nicholas, Mark Norman, Brent Steyerwalt, Laurie Heinbach, Jerry Lanuza, Amy Felder, Harry Paymiller, Richard Miskovich, and many, many others. Thank you all.